Uh, it's my pleasure to recognize our, uh, our second panel and welcome you and thank you for your patience and indulgence uh, for being the second panel. Pursuant uh, to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before they testify, so I would ask you to please rise with me and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and no nothing but the truth? I do. May the record reflect all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I will introduce uh, the witnesses uh, from my left to right. Your right to left uh, first is Dr. Natwar Gandhi, who is the Chief Financial Officer of the District of Columbia. In the middle is Mr. Matt Fabian, who is the man Managing Director of the Municipal Market Advisors. And uh, last but not least is Dr. Alice Rivlin, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and was former chair of the D.C. Control Board. I will recognize each of you in the order that I introduced you for a five-minute uh, opening statement. And again, uh, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee, Mr. Davis, Ms. Norton, Mr. Clay. I am, as you pointed out, Natwar M. Gandhi, Chief Financial Officer of the District of Columbia Government. I am pleased to be here for the subcommittee's hearing on Mayor Gray's proposed 2012 budget and financial plan. Mr. Chairman, in 1995, the U.S. Congress created the Office of the Independent Chief Financial Officer to work with the Mayor and the Council to maintain the District's fiscal stability and enhance its financial viability. Since then, we have completed 14 consecutively balanced budgets and expect to end the current year in the same manner. Between 1996 and 2008, we turned a cumulative $550 million deficit into an impressive $1.2 billion fund balance. Further, we transformed a nearly bankrupt district government plagued with junk bond ratings into a financially credible jurisdiction with strong credit ratings. Indeed, our turnaround from junk bonds to status A category bond ratings was faster than any other major city that has undergone similar period of financial crisis, including New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Detroit. Attachment one to my testimony and the board before you on my left tells the story of the district's successful return to fiscal solvency and financial stability. This turnaround is a case study in commitment to improve financial management and practices. Our general obligation bond ratings have increased at an unprecedented speed. They now stand at A plus from Standard & Poor's and are in the AA category from Moody's Investor Services and Fitch Ratings. In addition, our income tax rated bo uh, re revenue bonds are rated AAA by Standard & Poor's. This is indeed a record of which the district can be justifiably proud. As in case of many jurisdictions around the country, the recession of the past several years had taken a toll on our finances. Our general fund balance has dropped from a peak of $1.6 billion in 2005 to $890 million at the close of 2010, a decrease of some $695 million over five fiscal years. In early February, the newly elected leadership and I visited the three rating agencies to discuss the results and lay out a plan for the future. I am pleased to report that Mayor's 2012 budget and financial plan meets the rating agency's expectation despite the difficulties experienced due to loss of about a quarter of previously projected 2012 revenues and the expiration of the Federal Stimulus Fund, a loss of some $228 million compared to the previous fiscal year. The Mayor's proposed budget meets all the criteria required for certification by the Chief Financial Officer, and they are, this proposed budget is balanced, it does not use any fund balance, that is, it requires the district to live within its means. It is in compliance with our Debt Cap Act, which limits the debt service on our tax-supported debt to 12 percent of expenditures. Mr. Chairman, I would like to take 
the issue with those who proclaim that the district's finances are fa failing to the point that a reinstatement of a control board is imminent. Yes, the district is facing challenges, but none of these seven control board triggers will be breached. Congress, in its wisdom, created the Office of Chief Financial Officer for the purpose of preventing any of those triggers. Our elected leadership pledged to the rating agency and to the district residents that they will do what is necessary to balance the budget without the use of fund balance and limit borrowing to stay within the debt cap. Our challenges, however, are significant. The district, as the urban center of a large metropolitan area, the houses a disproportionately large share of very poor and needy citizens. District's overall poverty rate of 17 percent and the child poverty rate of 26 percent are among the highest in the nation and more than three times the comparable rate across the neighboring counties. Unlike other jurisdictions that provide services to a large share of regions poor, the districts cannot divert resources from wealthier suburban areas to serve its urban poor. In this environment, the continuing expenditure needs, the challenges posed by the reduced revenues is substantial. Kindly permit me to briefly note two areas that merit continuous attention. Both go to the unfunded mandates that restrict the district's own taxing power. The prohibition on taxing the income earned by non-residents, including those who commute into the, into the city on a daily basis, that 66 percent of income generated in the district is earned by non-residents and makes the simple point. The district also has an especially high concentration of non-taxable real property, much of it of the tax rolls due to presence of the Federal establishment. The value of the property held by the Federal Government alone is 30 percent of the non-residential property values. Mr. Chairman, I will not belabor on the issue of the uh, district's budget autonomy. Mayor and the council, uh, Chairman spoke so eloquently about that, but I emphasize my endorsement of their views. I want to thank you for your leadership, sir, and appreciate your visiting Wilson Building, indeed, our offices, and appreciate your interest very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi. It was a, a pleasure to meet with you. Uh, Mr. Fabian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin to speak about um, the District of Columbia, I just want to emphasize that uh, Municipal Market Advisors, my firm, um, is a pure independent research company. So we, we, make, uh, we make no money on trading, underwriting, investing in uh, municipal bonds. Uh, we provide pure research and uh, sell that research for subscriptions, um, and that makes up about 95 percent of our revenues. Um, you know, normally um, when you know we do an awful lot of commentary about the municipal bond, and, oh, and and I have my statement which I'm submitted, but I'll I'll, I'll speak off that I think just to um, um, keep things time efficient. Uh, normally, uh, you know, our our company talks a lot about the municipal bond market in general, um, and we have spent a disproportionate amount of time in uh, in recent two years looking at distressed credits, Jefferson County, Harrisburg, um, uh, Vallejo, California. So it's a real pleasure to, to spend some time and look at uh, the District of Columbia, which has done so well in the in the financial crisis, uh, managing largely uh, you know through the practices from their management team like Dr. Gandhi. Um, I have to say that as as things have gotten tighter, uh, as as credit conditions and and tax revenues have gotten thinner across the country, um, the financial abilities of city managers across the country has been strained, and it, and it has begun to undermine willingness in 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 some cases to honor obligations. Um, that is completely the opposite of the case in the district. Um, we have seen very strong management responses, and um, I, if anything, an increasing willingness towards bondholders and and uh, toward their and, and toward servicing their obligations. So. Just you know, with that as sort of the the opening context, um, you know, there's two, and and you know, I, I have an, an awful lot of information in my uh, in my statement about the structure of the bonds and investor perception of the bonds. Um, but um, you know, let me say that there's two uh, particular uh, successes I'd say from uh, that management has had over the past few years. First is the imposition of the more uh, of the more conservative debt cap. Um, to uh, 12 percent of, uh, of annual spending. Uh, sorry, um, yes. And that has been uh, from, you know, widely recognized by the rating agencies as a credit strength. Um, and from, you know, looking at 
you know, the future economic prospects of the district and the country, things will continue to be very difficult. Um, the financial crisis for the States and for cities um, um, and for governments like the district is transitioning from a revenue problem into a spending problem. Um, so, you know, proactive limits on, on, on debt and leverage are very well received in the municipal bond market today. Um, in addition, their restructuring of their, uh, of their variable rate debt uh, over the last few years. Variable rate debt is, a, uh, it is a long maturity bonds where the coupon resets every week or every day. Um, mostly these are packaged with derivatives. Um, prior to the financial crisis, the district had about 22 percent of its debt um, in these kinds of instruments. It, very difficult because that is the exact kind of instrument which came under pressure in the financial crisis. Um, the district was able to use its, its new income tax uh, uh, um, uh, bond structure and because of its very high ratings was able to restructure a, a, huge, uh, a huge amount of that debt and it's now its exposure to variable rate is a very manageable 9 percent. So I have to say that they have been very proactive in hitting the exact area where the municipal bond market was weakest um, um, in their response. Uh, looking forward, uh, you, you know, I. I do say that, um, that you know, like I said before, the, the financial crisis is not uh, necessarily abating for cities and states. The National Governors Association has talked about a lost decade for state revenues starting uh, last year. So 2010 to 2020 are going to be a very difficult time for government managers everywhere. So I think, you know, continuing to, to prepare for the fiscal crisis um, uh, is, is, uh, is exactly what the district has done. Um, it, the, the, the improvements, the, the, the situation that has come up in the earlier panel talking about uh, budget autonomy is a, a, a very well, it is an important one for the municipal bond market. Uh, if you think about what happened um, just prior to the government shutdown, the, you know, the district, because of, its, because of how the debt is structured, uh, is able to service most of its debt even without congressional authorization and, 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 uh, and, and without the city budget appropriation except for the city certificates of participation. So there is there's a $240 million bonded obligation uh, that the district has, which, which they, you know, under, under the law would not have been able to pay had the Federal Government shut down. So there, there could now, now the city managers were doing all that they could to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, but they were taking emergency steps to do so. In theory, it, they may not have been able to pay that, uh, those, those interest payments, which is something that even in the depth of the financial crisis, the district did not miss a payment. So, you know, in this current municipal bond market where there is um, an enormous amount of concern being, uh, you know, being put on uh, credit quality of State and local issuers, you know, to have the district even incidentally miss, miss a debt service payment because of the actions of Congress, you know, would have had a, um, um, a, a real impact on the debt service cost of the district going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fabian. Uh, Dr. Rivlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to testify today. I have been involved with the district's finances uh, for a long time, for more than two decades. Over that period, our Nation's capital has gone from a financial basket case to a responsibly managed and fiscally healthy city. In my brief remarks, I will try to put uh, the district situation in some historical context. This year, Washington, like most cities, is dealing with difficult uh, budget choices. The deep recession and the extraordinary weakness of the housing market have cut city revenues, especially property tax revenues. And at the same time, the increased needs of the jobless and homeless residents have put upward pressure on spending. This combination has made balancing the budget far more challenging in the last three years than earlier in the decade when things were going better. That is true of all cities. The impact of the recession on D.C.'s finances has been considerably less serious than in many cities that were hit harder by the recession and the foreclosure crisis. Compared to other cities, the D.C. economy is actually doing quite well. Uh, jobs are up, population is growing, economic development is resuming, and city revenues are beginning to edge up again. However, as the Mayor and the Council Chair have emphasized, Washington is a bifurcated city with prosperous areas and on the, primarily on the western side of the city and high rates of poverty, unemployment and underemployment primarily on the eastern side. 
So uh, efforts to mitigate these problems make the D.C. budget challenging. D district must provide both city and state-like services, and it has a narrow tax base, mainly because Congress prohibits the district from taxing the incomes earned in the city by non-residents. Mayor Gray has proposed a combination of spending cuts and revenue increases designed to close a budget gap that was estimated at $322 million. This is a rather small shortfall in a $9.6 billion budget, of which $6.3 billion uh, are uh, locally raised uh, funds. There will be a debate about this budget uh, in the Council, but I am confident uh, that the final budget will be balanced in a fiscally responsible way. The main reason for my confidence is that the City has a strong record of fiscal responsibility stretching back to the end of the 1990s. More importantly, the Mayor, the Council, and the Chief Financial Officer are all committed to maintaining that record and avoiding any danger of the triggering of a new uh, control uh, period. I was personally involved in that unfortunate period of uh, D.C. fiscal history and share the view that it must not happen again. Uh, in early 1995, uh, the district was facing imminent uh, bankruptcy. It was a really bad situation. Uh, the Federal Government had to step in and do what a State normally does, uh, put in place a uh, control board. Uh, uh, I was President Clinton's uh, point person uh, on doing that, and I worked closely uh, with Delegate Norton, uh, with uh, Congressman Chair uh, Tom Davis of uh, uh, the Congress, uh, of, with Speaker Newt Gingrich and the leadership of the Senate. It was a fairly bipartisan effort. It had to be. Uh, and it resulted in the creation of uh, the Control Board and the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. We wound up the control board uh, successfully in 2001. Uh, the district residents and officials have taken the lessons of that difficult period uh, to heart. Uh, for more than a dozen years, as has been emphasized before, the district has been a model of fiscal responsibility, has continued uh, to balance its budget, uh, built up its fund balance and cash reserves, and improved its credit rating remarkably. In the last several years, uh, as the recession reduced revenues, the district has drawn down its fund balance, that is what reserves are for, uh, but not to dangerous levels, and it is now in a position to begin replenishing uh, those uh, reserves. It is now past time, I believe, for the Congress to recognize the district's exemplary fiscal behavior and pass legislation giving the district fiscal autonomy, the ability to spend its locally raised revenues as its elected government uh, sees fit. Uh, this would represent your faith in representative democracy, uh, that it works. I have testified before on this subject, and I attach uh, my testimony of November 2009 uh, for the record. In short, Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe that the District of Columbia has a manageable fiscal challenge this year and be con can be counted on to balance its budget in a sustainable and responsible manner. And I also believe that the Congress should demonstrate its faith in representative democracy by granting the district fiscal autonomy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Rivlin. Uh, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, can you uh, take maybe a minute or so and, and update us on, on the hospital uh, in, in the district? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as you know, uh, we took over the hospital in July of last year, uh, primarily to make sure that the satisfactory health care services are provided east of the river where th there is a large uh, needy population. And we wanted to make sure that there is no interruption of health care services. So at that time, uh, we took over the hospital. Uh, like any public health hospital, uh, not-for-profit public health hospital, this hospital also has its challenges. 
In addition, it had a troubled history. Uh, and uh, it has uh, substantial issues that we need to resolve. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, district would have to be quite mindful, uh, given our experience earlier with DC General Hospital some 10 years ago. When we went to Wall Street, there was substantial concern about our owning the hospital again. Uh, mayor and the chairman and the leadership uh, at the council and in the mayor's office, they are all quite concerned about the viability of the hospital. We want to make sure that we provide health care services east of the river, but at the same time, we do not want to be in the hospital business. Uh, my expectation is uh, that the mayor and the council would resolve the issue satisfactorily. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, the district has a, a problem uh, that other cities have, although the district uh, problem may be uh, more exacerbated, which is tax-exempt uh, properties, properties where you have to provide the service, but you can't collect any taxes. Do you have a strategy? Do you have uh, a plan? Is there a means by which you can uh, uh, adjust for that, the fact that you are providing services to, to buildings and places where uh, you can argue there is not a contribution towards the greater good? Uh, that, that is a, one of the two major issues that we presently face in managing our so-called constrained, limited, restricted tax base. One is, of course, the inability to tax people who work here and don't live here. And second is, as I pointed out in my testimony, a large chunk of our real property is tax exempt. As I pointed out, the Federal Government, uh, the tax exempt institutions, the World Bank, IMF, embassies, etc. I used to have an office on the 11th floor of the Judiciary Square building. Outside, I look beautiful museums, monuments, galleries, nothing I could tax. That is a major problem for the city. It has a limited tax base. Other cities, like uh, uh, Hartford, Cambridge, Philadelphia, they do have a pilot payment, uh, payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, I am not so sure that that is going to work here. Uh, but I think the Federal Government needs to take into account the fundamental limitation of our tax base. In spite of all this, our commitment to you, sir, and certainly of the independent chief financial officer, despite these limitations on our taxes, we will balance the budget. Yes, we will maintain our financial viability and financial credibility on Wall Street. Dr. Gandhi, I have got about a minute left, so I will ask the question quickly and then you can have the remainder of the time. Uh, Long-term pension liabilities uh, in the city, uh, what is the, uh, what's the status, uh, any reason for, uh, for concern? Well, I, I think uh, in general we manage our liabilities very well. We do not have the major concern of the rest of the uh, jurisdiction around the country of the pension liabilities. We do not have that. Federal government took over a bulk of our liability on that front. All of our long-term liabilities, and particularly the pension liabilities, are actually funded, fully funded, actually speaking. So we are very blessed. And I would give great credit to our elected leadership, mayor and the council, for abiding by that requirement. Thank you. I would uh, recognize the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, given the fact that Representative Clay has a markup that he is involved in, I would ask that uh, I switch time with him and let him go, and then I will take his order. Without objection. Thank you. Let me thank the gentleman from Illinois and thank the Chairman uh, for conducting this hearing. Uh, a question for all three witnesses. Uh, how would you characterize the district's fiscal health uh, in relation to other large cities, and starting with you, Dr. Gandhi? Thank you, sir. Uh, I am pleased to say that, relatively speaking, uh, Washington, D.C. is in better financial condition than perhaps any other major cities out there. 
uh, we have still uh, $343 million of so-called rainy day fund. Uh, we make sure that our budget is always balanced. We have a very independent and vigorous office of independent chief financial officer that tracks our budget on a, almost on a weekly basis. So when you look at all these considerations, we are in a very good financial condition. And that is not just me saying it. Wall Street says that. They reaffirmed our AAA bond rating on income tax bonds, A plus category bonds ratings on our GO bonds with a stable outlook. That is more than what can be said about many other jurisdictions around the country. Dr. Ms. Fabian. Well, um, well, I would agree uh, also with Dr. Gandhi. I, you know, I think that the location of the Federal Government has been a, a tremendous economic stabilizer for the city, um, in addition to its management practices. Uh, um, looking forward, you know, one of the things that cities and states around the country have been very loath to do is, is, is to raise taxes uh, to help balance the budgets. Um, the district is at least um, considering this, and, and I think that, you know, from a Wall Street perspective, having a city uh, or a jurisdiction that is willing to look at all financial options to, to correct its structural budget gap is uh, a real positive. Thank you. Dr. Revlin. I agree with Dr. Gandhi and Mr. Fabian. Uh, we are in relatively good shape, and we are very lucky. I have sometimes said to the mayor when he was sounding down about the fiscal situation, cheer up, you could be mayor of Detroit. Uh, the, uh, the situation in cities that were in trouble anyway because they were losing their manufacturing base uh, is much uh, worse than it is uh, here. Uh, and uh, we, are, uh, we are lucky that our major industry is the Federal Government and the activities that it attracts, uh, and uh, those are uh, in pretty good shape. Thank you all for your response. And, and Mr. Chairman, as well as Chairman Issa, not to uh, engage in a, in, in, in a debate over the merits of the bill at this time, but as a question, uh, could this committee seriously, or the full committee, take a serious look at, at Representative Norton's uh, bill uh, that gives the city uh, control over its own tax dollars. Uh, and I think that, that with the testimony that we have heard today, uh, the City has certainly demonstrated uh, their ability to, to um, uh, in a fiscally prudent way, manage their resources. Uh, perhaps it is time that we actually uh, take a look at, at giving the City more responsibility. We are guests here. And I just would, would like to hear. If the gentleman would yield. Chair, yes. I have looked at the gentlelady's uh, draft legislation earlier on, and, and now I am uh, reasonably confident that, no, we cannot accept uh, budget autonomy fully. But I am going to be offering uh, an alternative that I hope the gentlelady will join with me on that provides a mechanism for a separate vote and separate uh, consideration of the district's funds. And that's what I was alluding to in my question with the, uh, with the mayor. And what I hope to be able to work uh, with Delegate Norton on is uh, an ability to have an early on annual vote to accept the budget, what I would call a contingent budget, the budget of exclusive uh, jurisdiction of the, of the district, meaning what they do with their money as it shall come in. I think that we would be hubris for us to assume that we could do anything about the appropriation process of other funds. But I think by bifurcating them, we can, in fact, come up with something that accomplishes what uh, Ms. Norton is, is asking for. We can do it uh, early on in every Congress and do it separate from the sometimes uh, difficult budget process. Yeah, and, and I thank you for your response. I, I would have to take a look at, at your proposal in more detail because I am looking for co-sponsors when I drop it. Well, so. but, but, but really, I, I, I still think that we are treating uh, this uh, locale as a, as a stepchild, and it is probably time we loosen the strings that we, that we have, have applied to them since the 1990s and move forward. I mean, they have, they have certainly shown fiscal responsibility. I know my time is up, but I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Missouri. At this time, uh, I would recognize the chairman of the full committee, 
the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your indulgence as all of us go back and forth to the judiciary today. Dr. Gandhi, um, earlier on when I asked the Mayor uh, about contingent budget proposals, I knew I was asking the wrong person, but he was the right person to be asked first. When you look at the finances of uh, the city, as a Federal city, with all of the responsibilities, certainly we have met with your police chief many times, and she has a responsibility like no other big city uh, police chief, because protests come here, other activities come here, which she must deal with first, even though she has backup of Federal agents. Do you believe that the district could produce an annual contingent budget? Now, let's assume for a moment we're, that we were a three-quarters, one-quarter ratio of, of all Federal funding to the district's self-funding for a moment. Do you believe you could produce a full funding document that would say, we have a contingent capability for, let us say, 10 months, meaning that if we receive substantially less, we can continue operating. If we receive nothing, we can operate for 10 months. And, of course, if it looks like for some reason there is no money coming, you would adjust. But do you believe you could produce that contingency that would take us, let us just say, from this month to the end of the year on an annual basis? Yes, sir. And, 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 and I say that quite advisedly, because the Federal contribution to the district, that is distinctly for the district, is less than 2 percent of its budget. We get about $174 million if everything that Mayor is asking for 2012, or the President is asking for, is $174 million in a $10 billion budget. What the budget autonomy uh, that I am endorsing here is that let us spend our local dollars. And obviously the $174 million that I am talking about uh, must be appropriated by the Congress in its usual regulatory and, 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 and legislative way, and that is fine with us. All we are suggesting here is, is that when we pass our own budget, as we, have, as we mm. will in June, that we should be allowed to spend money. And second, if you give us budget autonomy, then we would like to realign our budget with our specific needs. October, September, uh, the time frame doesn't work for local government. The next thing I would say is that dependent upon the Federal Government. Well, what, what date would work for you, Doctor? They work for any other uh, uh, local jurisdiction, which is June, July. So echoing what you are saying, if we considered a D.C. money only, and, and by the way, that would include, for example, a school lunch program that you expect to have Federal money for not getting it. So I want to make sure that when we talk about no Federal dollars, that you would maintain all that you believe you need. If that were the case and we were to deliver, you were to deliver us a budget by, let us say, March, we were to forward it through the Congress and have it passed before July as a freestanding separate from appropriations, that would meet your needs very well, recognizing that the dollars that would come from the Federal Government would come on a different schedule. Yeah, I understand that. And all, again, to repeat myself, all we want is to make sure that we spend, we are allowed to spend our local dollars according to our own wishes and according to our own timetable. Any other comments on, 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 the, on the idea of bifurcating the two? Uh, I think that it would be a, a real credit strength in, um, from a Wall Street's perspective. You know, I mean, still having that you know, level of uh, Federal oversight to make sure that you know, the district keeps its uh, game clean, but otherwise, um, absolutely. Well, and, and you said something, and I, I want to be careful. I, I don't want to accept game clean, but the view, at least from this side of the dais, on, uh, uh, for myself, has been that the district, although it has done a very good job in recent years, lacks an equivalent Los Angeles does a good job, but ultimately Sacramento has a major role in education and so many other areas. The view is we don't have as major a role, but we have a role. And I think that's what you were saying. Yes, exactly, exactly, absolutely. Doctor? Uh, yes, I think this would be possible and that it's a very good idea. And the Congress would not be relinquishing its ultimate oversight responsibility and the provisions that in extremists would bring back a control board. Well. 
it is the goal of this committee to have sufficient oversight and have sufficient good conduct that we will never go back to the days in which you had hands in every aspect of it far beyond this committee. I thank the Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Issa. The Chair would now recognize the distinguished gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton. The ranking member is taking Mr. Clay's place, so I understand. Um, uh, Chairman Issa's uh, proposal is something I want to, uh, I want very much, because it's the first I've heard of it, but it's one I certainly very much would like to work with him on and to build on. Indeed, I, during the uh, shutdown, I had a number of bills just to keep us uh, open for the rest of the year. But then I had one bill that said in the event of a shutdown, in any year, the district may spend its local funds so that I, we would not have to go through what you went through this time. Uh, it, it, what you say on schools, and I would like um, uh, any of or all of you to speak about that, um, the increase